I'm here now with Tom Larshide, uh, inductee in the media category for 2011. Uh, tell me, Tom, how does it feel to be inducted from the BC Sports Hall of Fame? It feels great. It really does. It's uh, it's the ultimate honor to me. Uh, I am so excited about it. It's it's a, a terrific recognition, and I'm humbled by that. Uh, it's just so nice to be recognized for your body of work in the city that you've lived in all these years. Uh, I've been a broadcaster for parts of five decades. Uh, I'm an old guy now, but uh, never too old to enjoy a moment like today uh, when it's been announced that I'm joining this wonderful class of inductees. We're all excited about it, and what else can I tell you? Sport has been my life. Where do you get the energy? I mean, it comes across in the airwaves, it comes across in your interviews. Where do you get the energy? Oh, I don't know. I, I just, uh, I have a passion for life. I have a passion certainly for sport. Uh, you know, I'm one of nine children and my mother and father uh, stress so strongly to my brothers and sisters as well as me to get involved in sports, to go to the playground, to be part of a team, or, or even if you wanted to go into an individual sport like golf or tennis, if that's really uh, what you like. They encouraged us so much. We didn't have money, so we had to go where things were cheap. <laughs> and so that's where I got involved in sport, and it led me to getting a scholarship to college on football. It brought me to Vancouver as a professional athlete. And then, lo and behold, I made this my home. I'm now a Canadian citizen who I'm so proud of, and I love hockey. Uh, I got in, you know, I never played hockey, as everyone knows. Uh, but it's a sport I would have loved to have played. It, uh, it has the speed and the skill and the bodily contact, all those things that uh, make it uh, the best spectator sport in the world. So you say, where does that enthusiasm come from? I guess it comes from enjoying what I like to do. And I've enjoyed my run. And now as I go into retirement, uh, you know, I, I'm not bitter or, or upset about anything. It's time. It's, uh, it's a new phase in my life. And I don't look at it like uh, it's the end of the line for me. You know, I, I still work at keeping my feet on the ground. But I have to tell you, I'll never stop reaching for the stars. Never. <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks. Congratulations in your day. Thank you so much, Jason. Thank you. Uh, even when they inform you about uh, the induction, they don't tell you uh, who the other inductees are. Oh, really? No, they don't. And uh, today uh, they had the announcement at the Olympic Village. And uh, Leslie, my wife, uh, joined me as we went down there and were just uh, came in the lobby, I guess maybe 30 seconds later, in walks Trevor Linden. <laughs> 
So I walk up and say hi to Trevor, and he says hi to me, and I said, uh, well, what are you doing here today? I assumed Trevor had been in. I <laughs> He's in everything else, isn't he? Exactly. I mean, you know, so I thought he was a former inductee that just came down for the uh, the press conference today, and uh, he says, no, he said, I, I, I'm going in, uh, into the Hall of Fame. I says, congratulations. And he said, uh, well, you're already in. What, what are you doing? I said, <laughs> I'm not in. I said, <laughs> I said, I'm here. Anyway, we got a big giggle out of that. <laughs> uh, the two of us were so surprised to see each other, and uh, boy, it's uh, it's really neat to to be going into the Hall of Fame with Trevor and all those others, which we'll get to, but oh, yeah. uh, but but there's something symbolic about you going in with Trevor. I mean, some of the greatest moments I'm sure you had in the booth were calling games that he was involved in. Oh, there's no question about that. Uh, you know, I have the highest respect for Trevor, as as does everybody in not only our city but in our province. Uh, he's just such an outstanding individual. Uh, we all know what a great hockey player he was and a tremendous leader. Uh, I always said about Trevor, uh, and you've worked with me uh, a few times too, Dan, in the booth. Uh, you know, Trevor, uh, he's like all the, the, the truly great ones. Uh, they save it for playoff hockey. Mm. He always elevated his game during the playoffs. Uh, that's what I always admired about Trevor. You know, there's a saying about uh, bring your best when your best is needed most. And, uh, you know, Trevor, I think, epitomized that description. Uh, I have the highest respect for him uh, as an athlete, but uh, even more so as a person. He's a he's a very good friend. So you get this call, and you've had a few weeks to absorb it. And uh, and why is it the biggest honor? And it is a great, but you, well, you, it's the biggest honor of your life. You're saying. I mean, those are pretty strong words. They really are, uh, Dan. And I I'm happy you you asked me that question. Uh, you know, I've had some really nice honors uh, that have happened to me. There's no question about that. Uh, being inducted into uh, Utah State University Hall of Fame as a football player is, uh, was a tremendous highlight. But, you know, when you think about that, that was uh, three years of my college career, and uh, it was nice. I, You know, I was fortunate to play with an outstanding team with some outstanding football players. But, you know, today, uh, you know, I've had more time to think about it. It's, it's all starting to kind of soak in a little bit is the fact that uh, they've recognized a body of work, mm. you know, a lifetime of work, really, for me. And I can't think of anything more heartwarming uh, than that. And that's why I say it's uh, such a huge honor for me today. When I initially came up uh, to play football with the Lions in 1962, uh, I, you know, I, I certainly hadn't uh, thought about saying, well, I'm going to make this my home. I mean, I, it's the first time that I'd ever come to Canada other than when the, the football team, uh, had flown me to Toronto, uh, prior to signing me to a contract. Uh, they, uh, brought me up for a great cup game, uh, in 1961. Uh, and the game was played in Toronto. And I still remember it was Winnipeg against Hamilton. Hmm. First time I'd ever seen a Canadian football game. <laughs> and, you know, I have to tell you when I, I saw the size of the field, and I thought, wow. Anyway, uh, it, I came up here, uh, of course, to play with the BC Lions, and, uh, you know, I was uh, young and, um, I, you know, really felt that uh, I had a, uh, a big future in professional football. Uh, unfortunately, it was cut short with uh, a couple of knee surgeries. Uh, so, anyway, then it was time to, you know, think about, well, where are you going to live? And uh, I'm so thankful that I decided to stay here in Vancouver, make this my home. And I'm even uh, prouder to tell you that, uh, you know, I eventually became a Canadian citizen. Yes, I remember when that happened, how tickled you were about that. Well, I'm very uh, tickled about that and proud of the fact. And uh, this city has been so good to me. Uh, all the people I, I bump into, everybody is... Uh, has always been so very, very kind to me. And I uh, I want to thank everybody. I, I said that today. I I just feel like I want to shake everybody's hand. <laughs> you know, I, I hope that I've inspired uh, young people to be interested in sports. Uh, I hope I've inspired, uh, inspired some guys who want to make their living doing what we do, Dan. Mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, you know, through uh, commentary and so on, uh, that uh, it... Uh, Turn somebody else on, like you got turned on by Jim Robson, and so did John Shorthouse. Uh, I hope there's a Tom Larshad out there somewhere that wants to come and get in this business and 
and um, it, it's a lot of fun, and, and it, it's been a privilege all these years to be behind the microphone and to uh, be in everybody's car and, yeah. and, their, and in their homes. Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, that's a that's a real privilege. It really is, and uh, I never took it lightly. Um, I always felt, uh, you know, I had some bad games too, but I, I always went in just like I did as an athlete, and that was, Boy, this is going to be the greatest game that I've ever played, <laughs> and this is going to be the greatest broadcast that I've ever done. Final thing, I'd like to just thank all the listeners. Uh, I had some great years at CKNW. I loved it there. And I also, Dan, if I could, before I leave, there, there's one thing that I think is really, really important, uh, certainly if, in my view. I want to thank all the station managers mm. that I have worked with uh, over the years who have stood behind my commentary and my style, and the way I do things. That uh, that whole run uh, to the seventh and final game in the Big Apple in New York City, uh, it was just wonderful hockey and a wonderful time for hockey in this city. Well, you had the feeling the way they came back like that. I mean, I think everyone uh, thought that the Canucks were buried and they were dead for sure when they were down three games to one, including uh, the coach and the general manager, uh, Pat Quinn, uh, Jim probably remembers I, I shared a conversation that I had with uh, Pat Quinn uh, when the Canucks were down three games to one, and uh, he said, hey, this team just isn't responding to me anymore. He said, uh, I think we're going to probably have to uh, just cut this team apart and go a new, act, a new way. In other words, uh, he felt like maybe this wasn't the team that could get the job done, and then lo and behold, <laughs> three dramatic wins in a row, and they were off to the races. So even Pat Quinn had his doubts there in that first round. Tom, you had about a second to look at the McLean save, and you right away called it, as we just heard it, the greatest save in franchise history and it still is. It really is, isn't it? Uh, you know, uh, the fact that I can remember when Jim was describing the play-by-play uh, with Fleury coming down the ice. Uh, uh, you know, these games were so exciting. Uh, you talk about nail-biting, but I was kind of even holding my breath because I thought, uh-oh, it's all over. You know how mm. you almost uh, uh, swallow your tongue a little bit, and and uh, McLean just uh, stacked the pads. I mean, he just made the right move at the right time, and uh, it was unbelievable, and we've seen this happen in sports, uh, haven't we, in, in uh, so many times over the years where a big save or something like that happens, and it turns out to be uh, uh, the springboard for great things for that team the rest of the way. When you were talking about uh, uh, putting this show together tonight, Dan, and uh, having my uh, my buddy on, uh, Jim Robson, I was tr- thinking, well, what are some of the things I can remember uh, that really uh, – have stayed with me all these years and uh it really i think uh, robson's call on greg adams overtime winner that put the canucks into the stanley cup uh and i heard it again tonight i mean it gives me goosebumps it's it's uh, mm. <laughs> only the great play-by-play guys can come up with the great call when it's required and jim has been able to do that all the time and uh that was a beauty well the thing we remember about game one uh it, it, you know it was great that adams of course scored uh, the winner in overtime but jim uh it was the goaltending of McLean. What did he face? 50, 54 shots that night? And, you know, you're right about that. Uh, they didn't play that well at home when they came back from New York. Uh, but, boy, I'll tell you, did they ever play well uh, once they went back? I think they're, everybody uh, in uh, in New York, including all the fans around us where Jim and I had to work, Jim often tells his story, you know, because of the overflow uh, with TV and radio and so on. We were down in the stands, and uh, the most difficult place to work, especially for Jim. And uh, they were all uh, – they were celebrating, weren't they, Jim, game five. They thought this was going to be it. The parade was all set. The police, all the motorcycles were outside there on 42nd Street or 33rd. It's a little sentimental when I think about it, uh, but it was uh, certainly a great run. It would have been nice if uh, if it would have been the Canucks winning by a goal and uh, winning the Stanley Cup, uh, but they came oh so close, didn't they? There's two things, uh, fellas, that I remember so much uh, about the, the seventh game, uh, and one uh, I kind of predicted uh, – uh, after the Canucks won so convincingly in Game 6, and I still feel that Game 6 uh, in 94 is uh, maybe the greatest hockey game the, the Vancouver Canuck hockey team ever played. Uh, certainly in my view, uh, I thought it was uh, the greatest. But I had a feeling. You remember the Rangers had finished first overall. They'd won the President's Trophy. The Canucks had had a couple of great seasons prior to this season in 94 they were just around a 500 hockey team if i recall 
And I just knew that Mike Keenan uh, and the Rangers, uh, Neil Smith, would be complaining to Bettman and all the officiating crew that, hey, how can, you know, we're getting a bump deal. you got to call these guys. Because remember, the Canucks were a big team. They were strong, and they were bouncing the Rangers around pretty good. Mm. And I really had a feeling that uh, they they were probably going to be called for penalties early in the hockey game and could burn them. And, and that's exactly what happened. I thought Terry Gregson, boy, really laid it on the Canucks. And uh, they got a couple of goals. I think they were power play goals too, yep, uh, Jim, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And uh, you know they, but they 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 overcame that, you know, and they battled back. Uh, Linden was fantastic, and Nathan Lafayette, of course, hit the post. And the other thing is what Jim just touched on. I I couldn't believe how the players, uh, not only the players but the coaches, by the time Jim and I got down to the locker room, and uh, they were so down. And and uh, Pat Quinn, uh, this big. Uh, strong, huge Irishman, you know, that has such a presence about him, and to, to see him over there uh, sitting down in the coach's room with the rest of them, and tears running down his cheeks, and then going and see players like Ronnie and Babbage and these guys, and oh, I'm telling you, it's something you'll never forget. And, uh, it just goes to show you, uh, you know, uh, a run like that, how it can capture a, a city, uh, it can actually capture a country, a uh, I, I'm sure that all of Canada was rooting for the Canucks, except maybe Toronto. Hmm. <laughs> but uh, it, it was it was magical, and it's uh, oh sure. I mean, uh, I I hope it'll happen again. Uh, the chances of it happening, I guess, uh, in um, what's remaining of my broadcast career, uh, they're going to have to really turn things around here in a hurry and get very very competitive for it to happen again. But. Uh, uh, I was lucky to be involved in two of those runs to the Stanley Cup final. Uh, uh, the first one, of course, it was uh, a mismatch against the New York Islanders, but the second one, uh, and Jim, you'll agree, it was a beauty. The love and the friendship that I'm feeling right now, not only from my colleagues that I've worked with all these years, but uh, certainly the listeners, uh, it, they have, have made me feel so good. You know, it, no one really knows what other people think about you or your work. Yeah. Uh, but I'll tell you, it's, a, it's such a heartwarming feeling for me, you guys. Uh, a person said to me, he said, you know, Lars Scheid, I can always tell when you're happy because I can see that smile. I can feel yeah, it you can through hear the, the radio. But I also know when you're not happy, <laughs> you know, and the forehead is wrinkled <laughs> and you're hot about something. You know, that's a good question. It, it's really started to hit me this morning. I... I've had a couple of months to uh, get ready for this, and I haven't prepared anything. I, I mean, that's just me. It just comes, and I, I, probably that's the best way. I, uh, it's starting to hit me now a little bit uh, that this is going to be my final broadcast. Yeah. But you know what? I have so much to be thankful for, you guys. And that's, those are the kind of things that I'm thinking about right now, the great memories, the wonderful people I've met in this game. <laughs> I love John Shorthouse, yeah. and I'm going to tell you why. Uh, I've worked with the best play-by-play -play broadcasters in the business. Jim Robson, a Hall of Famer. Yeah. He set the bar for everybody. Jim a Houston. wonderful guy. Jim Houston, now the number one guy on Hockey Night in Canada. And John Shorthouse, who the last, uh, I guess it's close to 12 years now that we've worked together. Wow. You know what? We had instant chemistry the day he came in the booth. And you guys I know what chemistry is all about. Yeah. Look you at how successful you've been for 10 years. <laughs> yeah. No, you can't buy that. Yeah. It's there. And Shorty has been more fun for me uh, in these uh, last few years of my career uh, than I could have ever imagined. He is such a pro. He is sharp. He's on top of it. He's fun. He's giving. He's kind. John Shorthouse said when they were listening, this was in 2004 during the NHL uh, strike, uh, you know, lockout. Mm -hmm. It was a lockout. Mm -hmm. And Bruce and I and, and uh, Bob Marjanovic, we call him the big moj, we love to pound on him. <laughs> well, I'm telling you, people used to phone in that they'd have to pull their cars over to the side of the road. They were laughing so them. hard. <laughs> and then or, or a guy would say, people are looking at me like they're going to, uh, the, the funny farm's going to pick me up and put me in a straight jacket. He's laughing so hard. He's the only one in the car, <laughs> right? And uh, Shorty said to me, he said, that was the best hour in talk radio in the city in sports talk. I, I'm blown away uh, by all the love and the friendship that I've been receiving, uh, yeah. especially from my colleagues. Uh, boy, I'll tell you, yeah, you, you must have done something right when the people you work with in the business uh, 
uh, respect your work and uh, have enjoyed uh, your company over all these years. And and uh, and that has really been genuine. And I I feel so very very good about that. You know, I I'm a little uncomfortable uh, with all this coverage today. I think it's just so wonderful that people feel that they want to do something like this. But you know, Ted Smith, I'd like to get into that if I can. Everybody says, "How did you get the start in the hockey booth?" A former football player. Da 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 da. Well, I'll tell you, that wasn't so easy, guys. <laughs> but Ted Smith, who was the general manager of CKNW, uh, he decided, along with Al Davidson, who was then the sports director, that. Jim Robson needed to have a color commentator. He was losing his voice every year around January, February. Why? Jim did the pregame show. He did the between period show. He interviewed people. Yeah. He did the play by play. He did the color during the game and so on. So they thought, well, let's let's put a personality in there. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, Jim would be the first to tell you he wasn't happy about it. I mean, why would he be? You know, who's this football guy coming mm-hmm. in? A uh, relatively young in the business, too full time at that time, and uh, come in and be a color commentator. Well, if Ted Smith, as the manager of CKNW, hadn't convinced Jim Robson that I was not only the guy to be in the booth, but that I was the guy that was going to stay in the booth, yeah. I wouldn't be here talking to you guys today. So I, I have so much to thank a, a station manager who stood behind mm-hmm. me and believed in me. And then after about a, three weeks into the season, Jim was trying to help me about how to prepare for a game, and, and boy, I'll tell you, Jim Robson oh. really helped me a lot. As he has all the broadcasters that have followed him. Yeah. How to how to uh, keep a summary of the game as you're going along, who scored the goals, who are the penalties, and uh, Shorty does it now. Jim Houston mm-hmm. took it for him. I mean, Jim set the bar for everybody, didn't he? Yeah, he's Yoda. No, he, he is. He, he really is. And you know, the funny thing is, I started to read statistics while he was the second round draft choice in uh, 1977 mm-hmm. for the, and then he's six foot two, 200, uh, 190 yeah. pounds in those days. <laughs> Back then, yeah. <laughs> all of a sudden, Ted Smith calls me in his office and he goes, "Hey, I've been listening to the broadcast for about the last week. I can get any schmuck off the street to read statistics." I want the large side personality. I want the flair. I want people to have a reason to turn into the broadcast. I want them to laugh. I want them to be mad. I want them to suffer with the team. I want them to be happy for the team. And you know what, guys? That's all I've done. I've been the same since I went into the booth in 1970. Nothing's changed. Let me explain this. Uh, I really knew right from the get-go because... Uh, I had gone up against uh, the prejudice of the hockey fraternity. Who's this football guy coming mm-hmm. in yep. and is going to talk about our national game, right. the game that we all love, this American-born kid from Milwaukee who comes up to Canada. is not even a Canadian citizen at that mm-hmm. time, but I am now. This is my home, and I am Canadian. But, hey, listen, they had every right to do that. And I knew it, that no matter how hard I studied the game, and how many questions I ask coaches, general managers, players, and scouts alike. And to try to show everybody how smart I was about hockey, I still would never get my Ph.D., guys. <laughs> because in Canada, oh. once you're six years old, you're an expert. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know what? Yeah. My approach was, hey, I'm not, I, I never tried to talk like uh, I was smarter than the mm-hmm. fan and the listener. What I tried to be is an extension of the fan. Right. I asked the questions that the fan wanted asked. Some of them were tough, weren't they, guys, over the years? But I asked them, and I didn't care about the repercussions. And, you know, the other thing is, too, when I make my comments about a player does this or a player does that, if I'm raving about them or I'm kind of maybe calling him into question about his play, it was never malicious. But you know what? If Canucks management, Canuck ownership, players and coaches don't think that – all those people at Rogers Place tomorrow night aren't thinking the same things that I'm talking about, then they're mistaken. Be- and whether they're watching at home, they're doing the same thing. They're yelling back at the television set, shoot the puck, right? Okay, that's all it was, guys. I mean, I just wanted them to enjoy the broadcast, and somehow all of us with great play-by-play and uh, and then the combination of a color analyst that understands the business of show business that this is not a cure for cancer it's just a sport mm-hmm. but make it fun for people that's what i tried to do goodness it's just unbelievable what this guy does bingo bango bongo his name is Luongo. <laughs> he is too much i would say that 90 
eighty to ninety nine percent of my commentary is just right from the heart. It just happens, and I describe it or I talk about it and how it affects me. That's that's kind of the way I've operated all these years. I've always felt that uh, I was capable of making a living, no matter what it would be. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm so happy that it's been broadcasting. Uh, I've been uh, so lucky to have the kind of job that we have, and yeah. we, we, we don't take it for yeah, granted. We all love it. Yeah. We all love it. I mean, it's... Uh, it's unbelievable, and guys who love sport, who would love to be in sport like all of us, yeah. they would kill to have jobs like David Pratt and yeah. Donnie Taylor. They really would. And, uh, you know, I've, I've never never forgotten that. But I've always felt that, you know, you can – I always say, give them a tester. You'll find out what they think of you. <laughs> hey? Yeah, just throw it out. Just throw it out there. I used to rib some of the guys on the road. I say, you pick up the tab. Well, no, that's not on the expense account. I said, give them a tester. You'll find out if they're really high on sure. you. <laughs> no, but it's true. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. true. But you know what? I think I, I feel for anybody who's fearful that if they say one wrong thing or they're out of step a little bit that they might lose their job, you're, mm. you're not getting the full potential of that person. And, uh, you know, so... Yeah, Donnie, guts, I don't know, maybe stupidity, too. I just never worried about it. Well, it, it was actually uh, in Denver, and um, he had uh, he had gotten wind that I had uh, said some disparaging remarks about his his effort. Yep. It was more that. And uh, so he came in, and, he, and uh, there were a few of the players standing around. A lot of the, the trainers were all there, too, uh, the Canuck trainers. And he just, I'm paraphrasing now, it's happened some time ago. Uh, and he said to me, he said, here, I hear you really ragged on me last night. And I said, I don't think I ragged on you. I said, I, I hold you uh, at a higher level than most guys with your size and your ability. I mean, you should be great every night. And he said, well, yeah, but you said I was floater. I was a floater. And I said, no, I didn't say you were a floater. And I kind of laughed like that. And he said, well, then what did you say? I said, babe. I said, you were a candy ass. <laughs> well, he just turned around and off he went. He, and it, the guys all started to laugh because, you know, it was something at that time he was kind of not utilizing that yeah. great size of his. Well, that, you was, know. That, that was his whole career was that. Oh, it was. And when he, those two years that he had in a Canuck uh, uniform, weren't those Brilliant. something? He yeah. was the best power forward in the National Hockey League. That's why League. he got on Team Canada. It, there's no question, Donnie. And, you know, a lot of people say, well, the players are upset with them. The players are this. Let me, let me go a step further about Donnie talking about having guts of what you say. And and I'll, I'll refresh Donnie's memory a little bit. And you know, you say, "Did you do you ever regret anything that you said?" I probably regret this comment, but the only one. And we were doing a uh, simulcast, Jim Robson and I, against the Winnipeg Jets. And one of the Winnipeg Jets challenged Trevor Linden to a fight. And Trevor, you know, uh, just uh, didn't really, to me, didn't really look like he wanted to go. And Momesso came in there and took over. And I said, "Hey." There comes a time when you're six foot three and you're 220 pounds. Yeah, you have to answer the bell. You have to show up. You don't have to win the fights, mm -hmm. but you got to show your teammates that you can stand up to it. Well, the wrath of God, Trevor Linden. I mean, he's the poster boy of the Canuck franchise. <laughs> I mean, that was probably the all time low. People bombarded me on every talk show, and you were hosting them. Donnie, you came yeah. and did a special on yeah. TV about it, yeah. you know, yeah. interviewed Trevor, this and that. Well, let me tell you about Trevor and about Todd Bertuzzi and about any of these guys. They know that I always respected what it takes to be a professional and that I've always loved every one of them. It's a tough business. But I also have to call it the way it is. But you know what? I just got the most beautiful email from Trevor Linden. Beautiful. Uh, Todd Bertuzzi, when I was operated on in 2004 in the lockout and I was up at St. Paul's Hospital, guess who uh, the phone rang and picked it up? Todd Bertuzzi. No, no. These guys all know. I've never had a problem with players or coaches or anybody else because they know that I really cared, and I cared about them. And You know, uh, Brian, uh, you guys know, and, of course, you've had your moments uh, with uh, with. Sure. Him. In fact, uh, people, people... Tell me anybody in this in this media business who hasn't had his moments with Brian. There's no question. There's no question. I, I mean, but you know what I couldn't understand? I'll tell you the story about okay. Burke, and then I'll take it about your situation, <laughs> okay. if I can, very quickly. Sure. Uh, Brian, uh, you know, I had lined him up to come in as my uh, first period or second period intermission. I don't recall at the time right now. And, you know, he came in, and, and you know, there was never a microphone he, he didn't love. He loves to be interviewed. He loves to have the exposure. Well, he came in. It was like uh, pulling teeth to get an answer. It wasn't Brian Burke. 
And I, I would be quite honest with you, I was getting a little tired of, uh, you know, the one and two word answers and kind of sloughing me off. And I, so I said to him, I said, you're not really into this tonight, are you? And he says, no, I'm not. So I said, well, take a walk. <laughs> and now he looks at me like startled, like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And I said, no, Shorty and I will finish it. Just take a walk. No pen, no nothing. Walk. <laughs> I mean, yeah. So that was it. But I mean. You know, and he knew I was right. I never heard back from him. He knew that uh, he wasn't cooperating. He was, he just he was in a bad mood that particular night. But those are some of the fun things in the business. But here's the other thing. He goes to Anaheim. He gets uh, he's general manager and I walk in the first thing he comes around the corner and he says, "Tommy, don't ask me to go on the air. I'll never go on that team 1040 while that David Pratt is working there." <laughs> he said, "It's nothing against you, but I will never support that state." And you know what? To this day he won't support us. <laughs> he won't go on with me. It, guys, I feel so good about my career. It's time for me to go. I am 70 years old. It's time for other people now to pick it up and go with it. And I, I just want to thank everybody and all of you guys uh, for all the support that you've given me over the years. I, I, I truly, honestly mean that. It's uh, I just have a wonderful feeling right now. I I, I can feel uh, the love and the friendship. Uh, and, boy, I'll tell you, that's something that will last me a lifetime. I got a call from Bruce Allen uh, saying that uh, Michael Buble and Bruce would like to invite Leslie and me to see Michael's concert at the Rogers Arena. I says, you're kidding. I said, that's fantastic. He says, yeah, Michael's a big fan of uh, the Canucks, as you know, and he's a big fan of yours, and he would like to recognize you. I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, anyway, talk to Leslie. Uh, he's going to do two nights. They're both sold out. You know, can't you yeah. see? <laughs> Bruce, he's terrific. And he said... Uh, Friday or Saturday. So I talked to Leslie. Well, let's go Friday. So we went down on the Canada line. So that's all I knew. And, oh, they sent tickets out uh, yep. to, to my condo. And uh, so Leslie and I said, well, let's not fight the parking. We'll, we'll grab the Canada line, go downtown. And uh, that's exactly what we did. And when we were on the Canada line, uh, Leslie said, do you think Shorty will be there? I said, oh, he's a good friend of Michael's. I'm sure he will be. I, I would think uh, Shorty and Chris would be there. So anyway, I'm going around the building trying to find the gate to come in. And I go to a usher and I go, can you tell me what gate? And the guy goes, looks at me, he goes, Larshad, you don't know how to get into the building? <laughs> I said, I only have been going in one way, I said, for a, lot of, year, for a <laughs> lot of years, right? So anyway, we got to laugh about that. So we, we finally get into the right section, which was the club section. And sure enough, there's Shorty and there's Chris and uh, uh, Johnny Garrett was yep. there with his wife and, and uh, Shorty's mom and dad. So, hey, it's great to see you, this and that. And Shorty says to Leslie, I'm sitting right next to you guys. Oh, terrific. That's all we knew, really. Now, mm. Shorty then, midway through the concert, says, I got to go. I'll be right back. Well, what happened is a gal came with a headset on that's, you know, kind of yeah. working the thing. and You, let's go. To Shorty. And out he goes by. I was sitting in the aisle. Leslie was next to me and Shorty next to my wife. And away he goes. You're not so, suspecting anything. Well, no, I, 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 I'm not suspe expecting what happened. Okay. Uh, no, I figure Shorty's going to go up. And, well, with uh, something with Michael, but not necessarily yeah, a well, tribute Well, you know to what? You. They had said and shorty had said that when buble filled in for me that one time when i was yeah. on vacation that that shorty then would go and go on one of his concerts and sing a song made yeah. sense so basically that's what yeah. i thought was going to happen okay. and maybe they might say well good luck in your re you know your retirement time. <laughs> <laughs> anyway the rest is history so it was wonderful they uh they get uh, shorty he comes out on the stage yeah. and it sounds something like this tommy this is for you
You're leaving as the pits. Well, I'll miss you to bits. My favorite color of all was when you called bullshit. How good was that? That was terrific. It, it really was. Hey, Shorty's got a good voice. Not bad. Not bad. Uh, very, very good. No, I, it was just uh, wonderful, you guys. Uh, it uh, it's something that uh, I'll always remember. Uh, the response uh, it, it was uh, overwhelming, and uh, all I can say is thank you to everybody that was there in attendance and uh, made me feel so good that night. This is uh, this is a I think a pretty funny story. It really is, but. Uh, in uh, this is 1994, the the great run of the playoffs, and uh, it's against Toronto, and it's in Toronto. I I think Dar- Dan Marawelli was refereeing the game at that time, if I, uh, but don't hold me to that. But what had happened is uh, after the whistle, uh, rough play, pushing and shoving, and you know in those days uh, there was a lot of that, and I think it was Marty Jelena got cross checked right mm-hmm. in the face. And no call. And I was just into this, as we all were in those days. Uh, the Canucks were really starting to make a serious run. And it just, it overcame me. And I just said, this is complete bullshit. You know? And it, <laughs> like, and, uh, like yeah, right now. Just, now. <laughs> just, just, I mean, just like that, you guys. But, uh, you know, and boom, boom, boom. I guess nobody had ever said that before. And uh, there was, uh, you know, the radio station got called and uh, CRTC <laughs> and uh, columns were written about me swearing on the air. Da, 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 da. Well, I didn't know what to think. We come back. The series is tied up one <laughs> game apiece. We land in Vancouver. People are out at the airport. Players are getting off. And the, the fans are cheering, you know, as the guys yeah. come off. And I happen to walk out just in front of Pat Quinn and yeah. getting off the, the <laughs> charter. And guess what? Everybody started to chant. Yeah. <laughs> Bull do. Bull do. You know, just screaming it. I'm not kidding you. And Pat Quinn says, they're not here to see us. They're here to see Larry <laughs> <laughs> No, it's a true story. Pat was so funny. I mean, but, you know, it just seemed to capture the listener because I guess they were thinking the same thing. Uh, it, it, and... Um, I don't know. It's just uh, one of those things, guys, as yep. I say to you, I react what I see, and when I see it, I say it. Those were good days, weren't they, Tom? Well, they really were. Excuse me. I, <coughs> I'm a little dry here. I don't know where the yeah. cough switch is, but we'll get some water for you. Anyway, so. we're good. Uh, you say good days. Uh, I'm going to tell you how good they were. Uh, people, you know, always ask me, and, you know, you haven't gotten to it yet, but I'd love to comment about the superb guys I've worked with in the booth. Uh, getting back, I, I ran into Jim Robson uh, last week or so, uh, a couple weeks ago now, at the Jake Milford Charity uh, yep. Golf Classic. Yeah. And uh, I don't see uh, Jim uh, socially that much anymore. Uh, we bump into each other from time to time. But it's like an old friend, no matter if you don't see him for a year and a half or six months or, or five years. The minute you see each other, it's it's like old times' sake. You, mm-hmm. you just pick up where you left off. Uh, we both have that kind of respect for each other. And uh, so he was uh, coming up and uh, talking to me about uh, this being my last game coming up and so on. And we reminisced a little bit. We started to talk about 94. And I said, you know, Jim, I want to tell you something. As I have now reflected back uh, on uh, all these years that I've been in the booth with all you guys, I really feel that my best work was 94 with Jim and 
The reason I say that is because I was able to hear all the tapes now years later when the anniversaries were on. I didn't realize, and I listened very closely to how we worked in the booth and and the magic that we had and the calls and let Jimmy make his calls. And then I was able to come in and give my two bits and just to how we flowed and described the games. Well, it should be my best work. And it should be Jim's best work because it's the best Canuck team we've ever had. Mm-hmm. No one's no one's matched it yet. Yeah. So it required the best from the broadcasters. And, you know, both Jim and I feel that that was our best work. It was our best work. It, it really was. I, I don't have to tell you guys how I've been hoping to be able to do my best work again. You know, <laughs> I've been disappointed like everybody else. I thought that the great uh, West Coast Express of Bertuzzi, Naslin, and Morris and that team had a chance to win a Stanley Cup. And now this team with the Sedins and the Burroughs and the Kesslers and, and uh, Elaine Venue is the coach, a good coach, and Luongo in goal that maybe this is the year. Maybe this is the team that's going to finally win that elusive big prize that we all want this team to win, and that's the Stanley Cup. Does that make it extra tough to leave, Tom, because of that, the <sighs> yeah, team they've know, assembled? You know, uh, uh, when I say extra tough to leave, uh, I'm a realist, uh, uh, Donnie, that the fact is that I am 70 years old, and it, it, it's a young man's game. You, you, you have to pass the baton sooner or later. Um I would have liked to have gone another year uh, because I think this team has a big shot. I I really feel they have a big shot. I think that Mike Gillis, uh, and you know, it's interesting. You know, everybody's saying, oh, yeah, the Cucks got you. Who cares who said it's enough for me? I don't really care. I have no resentments about that. I want to make that perfectly clear to all our listeners and everybody. You know, I sent Mike Gillis a text before I was informed by our our bosses here at Team 1040 that uh, they wanted to go in a new direction. Because the rights are going to be coming up in a couple of years. Da 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 da. Anyway, I had sent Mike Gillis a text. He had just acquired Mahaltra, Hamhus, mm-hmm. Ballard, and I said, Mike, congratulations on your acquisitions. Tom Larshide. Yep. Yeah. I got a note back from him that said, "Thanks, Tom. Hope to see you soon." So, so you know that was it. I mean, I mean, I've always uh, uh, been rooting for this team to to win the prize and want them to win the big prize. And you know, if if a team, uh, I just throw out this caution, and if Canuck people are listening, listen to me about this. Is Dave? I heard your interview yesterday with Elaine Vigneau. Yeah. And I heard uh, Gillis chirping in the background, laughing yeah. and scratching. Yeah. You guys get along good, and that's fine. And and uh, you you should. And Elaine Vigneau was outstanding. He's very, very good dealing with the media. I, I think he's a first-class guy. I really do. And you said something. What about all the expectations? Yeah. Uh, all these uh, uh, magazines and the prognosticators are picking you to win the Stanley Cup. We love it. We love this kind of pressure. Well, I'm glad that they do. But I also want to send this message. If they love all that pressure... And they love everybody talking about them. Then they have to be able to take it when we want them to be accountable if it's not there. Mm -hmm. If the performance is not there. If the championship timber is not showing. They should be able to take that too. And I hope that this organization can. Yeah, I know it's getting to be the big suits up there. And they channel everything out that it's always really nice. Uh, But um, as I said on my... This might have got me canned was my little rant uh, in Chicago. You know, hockey fans aren't suckers. They see through all that stuff. And I've always known what the hockey fan thinks and wants, and uh, they know it. The people who have listened to me all these years and have supported what I do, and even the ones that really didn't care for my stuff, uh, they know that I cared, and they know that really the bottom line is we want this team to win. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. 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 We got it, I think, Tom. Oh, no. We got it. We got it. We got it. Where? We got it. 316. We got it. We do. We got it. Oh. You go, Tom. Oh. Go ahead. Well, we're out of breath up here in the broadcast booth. You know, fans, when you come to GM Place, they have that 50-50 draw. <laughs> well, <laughs> Leslie? <laughs> Leslie and Chris, you're not going to believe this, but we won it. 
<laughs> Shorty and I are going to split twenty grand. Oh my god! Oh, is that exciting or what? This is the best game I've ever seen. <laughs> I talked about having chemistry. Um, it's so important. The fans know when it's there and when it isn't there. Yeah. You know, as far as people working together and so on. Um, but with John Shorthouse, it was instant chemistry with us. Mm -hmm. uh, Shorty has been such a delight for me to work with you guys. Um, he is uh, he is bright. He is sharp. Uh, he's he's giving. Uh, he is just the ultimate pro. pro. He's going to have a well. He's having a marvelous mm -hmm. career as it is. But I'll tell you, he's going to carry the standard brand of that uh, Canuck flag, uh, just like. Yeah. Just like all the others did, uh, he's he's just a great great person, and I'm I'm so pleased that I get to do one more game with him tomorrow night. This morning on with uh, with Rintoul and uh, and Ray, uh, this is what Shorty had to say about you. I still remember it, and I've had designs on this job since I was about six or seven years old. Um, and very lucky, obviously, that it's panned out the way it has. But I, I still remember in the the mid to late nineties. Um, before I got the job, but you know, I, I was really angling towards it and, and wanting it. And uh, Orca Bay at the time uh, w was starting to get into my corner a little bit. They were looking to groom a local guy to do the not only the Canucks but the Grizzlies as well. And so I was doing some mock broadcasts of both. Uh, and and t Tom has told this story before, but I was trying to keep it on the down low because I had a job at Sports Page, and I, I didn't want people to know. Well, a couple of reasons. I didn't want people to know that I was looking to move on, and I also didn't want somebody else to sort of glom onto this opportunity and start doing mock broadcasts themselves in the hope of uh, getting in front of me in line and maybe stealing my job. So I remember one night I was very quietly, surreptitiously doing one of these mock broadcasts up at the other end of the gondola, and one of Tom's intermission guests didn't show up. And uh, so he came down. He knew me a little bit from Sports Page, and he said, would you mind filling in as, as the intermission guest? And I said, sure, no problem. And it was pretty exciting. You know, I'd never been on the Canuck broadcast um, before. And so I phoned my mom real quick and said, listen, I'm going to be on between periods. You might want to tune in, blah, blah, blah. So Tom, as you know, he loves to give the great uh, build-ups when he's doing an interview and make you feel really good about yourself. And so he launched into this whole, well, you know him, one of the real up-and-comers. He's been at Sports Page for six years, a uh, real great sense of humor, a, a real uh, expert in the – the city of Vancouver on all sports, but especially the Vancouver Canucks. It's my pleasure to welcome to the Canucks broadcast, John Stackhouse. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. And I had to, because I phoned my mom, so I had to say something. He said, Tommy, it, it's Shorthouse. But, you know, thanks for having me on. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. The friendship was born right there. <laughs> oh, it really was. Isn't yeah. that a funny story? Yeah, great. Guys, yeah. it, it really is. And, uh, you know, I and I think uh, how I recovered, I said, ah, Stackhouse, Shorthouse, what's the difference? How are you? It's nice to have you on. What do you think of this team? Yeah. But, hey, lo and behold, a year later, he was sitting next to me there in the you booth. Go. So, a so year, that worked out. A year later. Uh, and, uh, you know, I never thought uh, that I would be nervous for my final game like I am, but I... I have the butterflies right now, but I, maybe that's a good thing, you know. Uh, I used to have those when I was an athlete many, many years ago, and uh, maybe that's a good sign. How do you want to be remembered? Well, oh, I, I think I'd like to be remembered as uh, a guy who really loved his team, uh, a guy that uh, called it the way it, it was at the time. Certainly, in my view, I always tried to bring honesty to the broadcast. Uh, I knew that... I was different than uh, most guys that sat in uh, my seat. They're former hockey players. I wasn't a former player. Uh, I realized very early uh, in this game that uh, no matter how hard I worked to learn the game and to know it, I would never have the uh, credibility because I never played the game. So my approach was uh, maybe I can bring something a little bit different, but still listeners wanted to tune in. And what that was was enthusiasm. Uh, you know, I, I had a, I have a passion for the game, and I hope, hopefully that transcended through the airwaves, and that uh, I had the ability to make people laugh. I had the ability to make people mad. Uh, I pushed a lot of buttons, but in the big picture, uh, really, I just uh, hope that people enjoyed what we did as broadcasters. 
and that's with all the great play-by-play -play guys that I was fortunate to work with. It started with Hall of Famer Jim Robson and Jim Houston, who's now number one on Hockey Night in Canada. Of course, Shorty, I've really been a wonderful run with him. We had instant chemistry right from the get-go. And then uh, a few games that I've done with Rick Ball, who's a real top-notch broadcaster. So I.